All right. This is the Big Douglas Show. Make sure you subscribe, like, hit the notification button. I'm Big Douglas. That's Cousin Pat. And we are happy to welcome in J.J. Record from NBC uh, Washington. Good to be with you guys. Glad to have you. How's it going, J.J.? Good. Uh, well, four games in a row, I think I saw, was the longest in two years. So I know they are glad to get that monkey off their back and, and get rolling. Uh, I must admit, I am not the biggest hockey aficionado. That's why I bring Pat for the heavy lifting. But that second quarter yesterday was something. Yeah, the second period was big. Uh, they dominated the second period the last time they played the Penguins, too. They just couldn't cash in and, and take the win. But yesterday, that was the most complete game I think they played this entire season so far. And the second period was a major part of that. They scored twice, gave up no goals. They forced four penalties, gave up no penalties. It was just a dominant performance by them. Yeah, I agree, JJ. That, that's what uh, uh, Craig Lockton was saying last night. He said it was the first time they put 60 minutes together. Um, Vanacek got off to a hot start. He was rookie of the month. And then, as Doug was saying, they, you know, they, they dropped four in a row. And they were kind of picking apart his uh, goaltending a little bit, talking about rebounds and rebounds he was giving up. Was it a great effort from him last night? Or was it defensive guys clearing out clearing out loose pucks or was it both what, what do you think uh he was better last night than he has been but i saw a much better team defensive game from them than what i've seen the last few games you know um in the first one or two minutes there was a five-man back check to break up an early opportunity for the penguins and then before right before the Capitals scored their second goal Alex Oveshkin got on the back check to break up a two-on-one from Pittsburgh, and they end up scoring on, on the counterattack. So I saw a much better defensive game. If you hear it from the team, they've been telling, saying this entire time that, hey, we're playing better. It's just a couple mistakes here and there, but we're playing better. It's, it's just the results aren't there. And I, I've been taking that with a grain of salt. I don't think you're, you're 30th in the league when you're playing better and it's just the pucks aren't going your way. I saw, I think they were much, much better in that second game against Pittsburgh than they have been for weeks now. They were, they were usually on the short end of the stick on faceoffs one. Um, I think they were 50, 50 last night. Mm -hmm. Do you contribute any of that to the success, success, the success they had last night? Or do you think that was just, you know, how it shook out? Yeah, it, it's, you know, faceoffs are one of those things that it, you're not going to get that much of an advantage by winning faceoffs 53%, 55%. I just don't think it matters all that much. Specific faceoffs matter. The problem is, is that when you get into 60% and, or above, that's when it starts to matter. That's when you just can't get possession. And that's what we saw the last game. So 50 50 is good. Uh, any really for me, anything between 45 and 55, you're fine. You don't really need to worry about it. It's just the specific ones, especially in overtime, when if you lose that faceoff, you literally may not get the puck back because it's just hard to get possession of the puck. So do I look as, at that as a major factor in the game, the fact that they were 50-50? No, it was a factor in that it, it wasn't over 60% for the Penguins like it was the game before. JJ, I heard last night a bunch of the announcers, particularly in that second period, talking about uh, the penalty kills and how good they were at doing that. Explain that to me, the, the idea. Uh, I mean, I know what a penalty is, but the, the bonus and, and how, you, how you make sure that you're not getting overwhelmed there on that. Right. So in the penalty kill, obviously you're man down. So you have to shift how you play defensively. The Capitals under Peter Laviolette play mostly a man defense. So obviously you have to change that up because you can't just let a man go free on, on the penalty kill. So it, it's really, um, it's more about blocking passing lanes because what teams are really looking to do is they're trying to get a guy who's open in a dangerous opportunity because they know that you can't cover all points of the ice because you're a man down. So the biggest part is blocking passing lanes, making sure they can't get those nice setups to get those pr pr those great scoring opportunities. And the Capitals have been decent at it this, this season. I think there was one game, I believe it was against the Buffalo Sabres, where they allowed three power play goals. That sort of dropped down the average. But for the most part, they've been a solid team on the penalty kill. I think it's something Zidane Ochara has done very well. 
Um, he, he's the anchor back there. Um, so for the most part, I think as much as this team has struggled defensively, the, the penalty kill has actually been pretty decent. They had a picture of Chet real quick. Pat, they had a picture of Charo next to Vanacek. I saw somewhere. And it was just funny to see how tiny uh, one man looks to another man. It's it's crazy. You hear six nine and you think, okay, that's big, but you don't really realize how big that is until you see him with some of the other players, and it's just it's incredible to see. <laughs> hey JJ, Al, um, Alan May was talking a lot about their defensive strategy and how he thinks it doesn't really cater towards you know guys like Chara. Chara's great on the penalty kill because of his length and for his ability to you know get in lanes and 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 move move pucks out. Do you think that they're he, he's calling it their man-to-man -man approach. Do you think that hurts them? Do you think they'll change that up and we see maybe a different philosophy going forward? Or maybe so, Yeah. I, I understand what he's saying. Zeno Chara doesn't have the wheels anymore. And so if you're playing a man-on-man -on -man and you've got a guy, you're responsible for covering a guy who, who is faster, who is more mobile, then you're at a disadvantage. He's a smart enough guy that he can usually get himself into a good position to cover who it is. But I think a lot not just Chara, we've seen a lot of situations early on where their teams are taking advantage knowing that they're a team with a new coach, a new system, and they're doing, using a lot of quick passes to get people lost in the defensive zone. And people are getting their wires crossed. And you see two guys end up with one guy, another guy goes free. I think that that has been an issue so far. So that's something that will get better as the season goes along. But in a shortened season, you don't have as much wiggle room to adjust to this new se season, this new system, as you would in a regular season. Do I think they're going to abandon it? No. I think Peter Labulette has come this far with Kevin McCarthy, who's the guy in charge of the defense. Uh, they've been a tandem for many years now. So I don't think we're going to see a wholesale change in how they approach defensively. They may adjust depending on who their personnel is, but – Really, if it were a problem, we'd see Jonas Siegenthaler get more games and, and Chara sit a couple because Jonas Siegenthaler is brings – Jonas Siegenthaler is more mobile. He's an NHL player. In any other team, he'd probably be an everyday player. He's more mobile than Zidane Chara. Zidane Chara is more physical and has those leadership qualities. If it were a real huge problem that they were really concerned about, you'd probably see Siegenthaler get a few games and then they tell Chara to sit it out. But like I said, he's smart enough that he's usually able to recover well and know where he needs to be. But this is, yes, these are, we've seen offensively, the Caps have adjusted pretty well to this new team, this new system. The, defensively, there's still some growing pains there. Where, how does it look for Sam Sonoff? Do we have an update on him? Sam Sonoff? Yeah. Uh, so Sam Sonoff, um, he's in Hershey doing a conditioning stint. He played one game. Hershey plays again on Wednesday. Um, I'm looking forward to the Cavs play tomorrow. So I doubt they would bring him and have him go Wednesday, Thursday, but the Cavs have a back-to-back -back this weekend. So if I had to guess, I'd say he's back here for this week weekend and he's playing one of those two games. The fact is Craig Anderson, I, I think during the stretch, we would have seen Craig Anderson in if he was viewed as a viable option at goaltending right now. And I just don't think he is. I think, Vanacek would have been pulled in that last loss against the Penguins, and he wasn't. I think we've seen Anderson get a start here or there. And we haven't. So I, I, looking at a back-to-back, -back, I think the Cavs are going to want Samsonov back for at least one of those games. Yeah, you, you mentioned the, uh, the short season. Um, they're playing three teams coming up on the stretch Thursday, uh, Saturday, and Sunday that for all intents and purposes are at the bottom of the standings, but only by a point or two. What do you think they need to get over the next three game stretch? I mean, can they afford to go on a, you know, three game losing streak after a win? Like, you know, every, every point's precious right now. What do you, what do you think they need to get over the next three games? Right. Opinion? So I'll boil it down to one game and I, I and it's not even just a win because hockey's a dumb game and dumb things can happen. Sometimes a goalie can stand on his head, bounces, just go all over the damn place. So I, but I'm looking at, at this Buffalo game. It, it's a weird parallel with last season, last season, for half the year, they were garbage. They couldn't figure out what they were doing. Then they beat the Penguins, and it was their best, most complete game that we had seen in months, a 5-2 win in Pittsburgh, and they looked fantastic. And it was the first glimmer of hope you had in months of saying, maybe they figured this out. Hey, may, when, they're, when their feet were to the fire, when they're playing their rivals, they, they buckled down, 
and they really came together and they played this great game. And then two days later, they played the Buffalo Sabres, who were as bad, probably worse last year than they were this year. And they lost in a shootout. They had to come back from a 2-0 deficit just to force the shootout. And it was such deflating. You know, don't don't tell me about trap games. You don't get to have trap games when you're playing 500 hockey like the Caps were from December to March. You don't get to have trap games. If you lost three out of your last five games, you don't get to have a trap game against the Buffalo Sabres. So that was such a letdown and really a, refl- a more accurate reflection of where that team was over the game, the prior game when they had beaten the Penguins. So here's a weird parallel. They just beat the Penguins. It was their most complete game of the season so far. And now you're playing the Buffalo Sabres, who in their last two games, after a lengthy, lengthy break because of COVID, were out. they lost both and were outscored 6-1. to one. That is, You have to see the team who played Pittsburgh on Tuesday – in that game. Like I said, I'm not going to sit there and call this a must win. It's game 15 in the season. That would be dumb. And like I said, hockey, weird things can happen. So I'm not going to sit here and say, if they lose that game, if they don't get two points and the season is over, but I need to at least see that team who showed up in Pittsburgh in that last game in that Buffalo game. That that's what I need to see. Did, did I miss something yesterday when the, and maybe I'm just not around the game enough to know a stick broke or a stick was dropped. They didn't pick that thing up for a while. Is that protocol? I, that confused me as a guy that's just not around the game. I was like, damn, are they not going to pick that stick up? It looks dangerous. Yeah, the, the refs will go, the refs of the linesmen will get in there and they'll get that stick if the play is, if the puck is moved on, but they don't want to involve themselves in the play. So if the, if the puck is still around there, then they'll wait until until the play moves on. So it was like minutes. I thought for sure <laughs> someone was going to be a NASCAR crash out there. <laughs> yeah, it, it took a while because it was just. I think it was um, in the in the offensive zone for the Caps, and the Caps just held on to the puck, and then we're passing around, and the refs never got the opportunity to get in there. Yeah. Okay. Hey JJ, uh, Backstrom's off to his best start in his career or his second best start, he's leading the team in, in points, goals, and assists. Um, and then you have the, you know, the top three of Bechkin and um, Carlson right behind him. Who do you think, um, and I agree with you, I think tomorrow night is a, a huge game for them to keep momentum. Who do you think needs to do more for them or step up? Or who do you think is just not playing up to their potential right now for them to, to get on another streak, a hot streak like they were to begin with? Yeah. Um, you know, I, you, you the easy answer to this question is always Kuznetsov because we right. know how good he is and we know what he can do and so you always want to see him be that 2018 guy I think that was that was more the exception than the norm at this point just because we just never see that anymore which is unfortunate um TJ Oshie has been a little bit quiet but I, I think he's he's a guy who even when he's not producing is is giving you something so I, I'm not so much worried about him a guy who I'm a little bit worried about, I'm going to have to double check. I think Dmitry Orlov still has zero points. And that to me is shocking because one of the, the benefits of this new system was that it allows defensemen to be very aggressive offensively. Justin Schultz has thrived at that. John Carlson, you've seen take advantage of that. Maybe not to the extent that I expected him to, because when you score a million points last year and they have a more offensive coach, I thought he would just score all the time. Um, but he, he's played. Okay. Dmitry Orlov is a guy who's more offensive than defensive. And if I recall correctly, he still has zero points. That makes no sense to me. He's got to get it going because already the conclusion people jump to when you're out for several games and the team does well is okay. So the team doesn't need you anymore. I always think that's a pretty easy conclusion to jump to. I, I think that it doesn't, I don't always think that's accurate because I think when teams know their backs are against the wall, they pick up their play and are able to account for missing those players. But here's a guy, you already have a log jam on left defense. Dmitry Orlov is playing usually on your third pair right now because you have so many players and you have two prospects who are waiting to make the lineup. Somebody is going to be expendable. Dmitry Orlov right now isn't expendable, but if he's got zero point, if he can't even thrive in an assistant, it should be tailored for him to thrive in. He's got to do better. And even going back to that, the last loss against Pittsburgh, one of those goals was set up by a horrible stretch pass from his own defensive zone, where he tried to make a pass from the goal line into the neutral zone, bank it off the wall. I mean, it was just a pass that had zero chance of getting to anybody. 
So he's someone who has to play better because it's a position that, I mean, he may not be around here next year if he's not playing better. No, I, I agree. And they, they, they flashed a stat last night um, that 18 different players have uh, scored a goal for the Caps or third best in the league. And then I think it's a byproduct of just them being shorthanded. But I do agree that Orloff, you know, should have been a, a player to at least have a point by now. Yeah. Who surprised you? Um, what players has, I mean, other than the ones we're talking about, has anybody stood out to you that you has just played a, better than you expected uh, so far and, and you, you look for bigger things as, as it goes on? Anybody? Uh, two guys who jumped to mind, Nick Dowd, I, he's taken too many penalties, but his line has been great. His line has been great. They were leaned on a lot with so many players out because you basically had, I mean, you were down an entire offensive line for a while. And so they were playing a lot, but, but I like the way that line has played and I like the way he has played. And I, I think that's huge for them because really behind him, the, you don't have any center depth at all. So it's good that he can, he can elevate his game. And I also look at, at Justin Schultz, he seems to, he, he's a guy who people were wary of from Pittsburgh. Okay. He's got injury issues. He doesn't always play his best. He seems to have thrived uh, in this new system, in this new team. He was really, I mean, he had two points in three straight games before he took a puck to the face. And so he's been adjusting since he came back, but he really seemed to be picking up his game. I, I like the way he's played so far and fit in on the blue line. You know what I like? They say things like tasty in the broadcast. That's like last night there were all kind of tasty things happening. There are unique things that uh, that they say in hockey games. I was loving that last night. Um, I thought, play, bring my notepad out here, we could play a quick game of where do they come from? JJ, you ready for this? Okay. All right. Nick Backstrom. He is from Sweden. Uh, do you want city? I don't know if I can give you the city of all these people, but he's definitely <laughs> Swedish. Well, well, I think the country's good enough. All right. Let's um, Michael Kempney. He is from the Czech Republic. He is from the Czech Republic. Daniel Sprong. Oh, I believe he was born in the Netherlands. Holland. Holland, that's right. Netherlands. Yeah. Uh, John Carlson. He's from America, Jersey boy, if I recall. I thought I was hoping I'd get slide one in. Uh, and lastly, Tom Wilson. Oh, he's a good old Canadian boy, Toronto. Uh, I thought I was hoping if I got the Tom and the John right there, I'd get to slip on of one of them. But no, that's it. That's it. JJ, I appreciate you stopping by for a little bit of time today. The uh, the stuff y'all are doing with NBC is great. How long have you been with NBC now? Oh, let's see. I started part-time with them 2012, uh, full-time 2015. So they haven't been able to get rid of me yet. I saw the uh, the buyer there. You started out freelancing and, and bet on yourself. I, I respect it. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> I see the uh, VT uh, banner in the background. Are you a Hokie? <laughs> no, my dad was a Hokie. I went to uh, okay. Yeah, I went, I went to Virginia Tech. <laughs> yeah, I went to William and Mary, so I kept uh, the Hokie fandom for because got to cheer for someone during football season. Got it. Yeah, you know, somebody, <laughs> anybody. Well, thanks, JJ. Appreciate it. Hey, anytime, guys. All right, man. Thanks. Take care.